As a trusted partner to the global life sciences industry, we know that scientific breakthroughs demand the very best. From the scientists doing the work to the tools and the materials they're using, there is a constant need to apply innovation and new approaches to address complex challenges. We know the importance of offering both quality and choice to the people who need it every day. It's why we offer more than 6 million high-quality, trusted products, including our own brands, all through our premier delivery platform, BWR. All of this combined with an infrastructure strategically located to help serve your specific needs helps move science forward fast. That's science delivered. Maryland Life Sciences would like to recognize today's industry sector sponsors. Representing biomanufacturing, Kite. Kite, a Gilead company, is a global biopharmaceutical company headquartered in Santa Monica, California. Kite has manufacturing operations in North America and Europe, including a new state-of-the-art cell therapy commercial manufacturing facility in Frederick, Maryland. Kite's singular focus is cell therapy to treat and potentially cure cancer. As the cell therapy leader, Kite has more approved CAR-T indications to help more patients than any other company. Representing cell and gene therapy, Maxite. As a pioneer in cell engineering technology, we're passionate about enabling the discovery, development, and manufacturing of the next generation of medicines harnessing the power of living cells to transform lives. For over 20 years, Maxite's core flow electroporation technology has aided researchers in delivering virtually any molecule to any cell, safely engineering the cells needed to develop new therapies. Our electroporation technology has been used in numerous clinical trials by leading pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies across a diversity of indications including cancer, central nervous system disorders, and rare genetic diseases. As we grow, we continue to evolve, working with our partners to produce best-in-class solutions that accelerate the development of novel therapies to improve patient outcomes. Representing vaccines and immunotherapy, Novavax. At Novavax, we never rest in our quest to protect the health of people everywhere. This mission guides all we do, we were relentlessly committed to promoting improved health globally through the discovery, development, and commercialization of innovative vaccines to prevent serious infectious diseases. As a biotechnology company based in Gaithersburg, Maryland, we are proud to support the 2022 Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference. We'd like to thank all of our industry sector sponsors for their continued support of the Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference. At Novavax, we are relentlessly committed to one goal, providing protection against the world's most urgent infectious disease threats, protection for families, for communities, for the world. We are working to create best-in-class vaccines by focusing on what matters most, Proving safety, establishing efficacy, trusted science, persistent hope. A protein-based established formulation is our foundation. An innovative recombinant nanoparticle technology platform is our difference. Developing adjuvanted vaccines against emerging and evolving infectious diseases is our strength. Our team of experts is working in partnership with leading organizations from around the globe to resolutely advance our pipeline so that whenever a vaccine is needed by anyone, Novavax is there. This is our commitment. Novavax. Our next panel will explore the practical and societal considerations that global health authorities, 
scientists, regulatory bodies, and manufacturers must weigh to successfully manage the ongoing COVID-19 threat. Please welcome your moderator, Yvonne Sproul, Vice President, Eternal Communications, Novavax. everybody. Thank you so much to the Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference organizers for the really warm welcome. Um, as the intro said, my name is Yvonne Sprout and I'm the Vice President of External Communications at Novavax. And we are a biotechnology company headquartered right here in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And um, our focus is really um, thinking about the most serious infectious diseases out in the world and thinking about vaccination through the de delivery, development, and discovery of innovative vaccine technologies. And you may be familiar with our work on COVID-19, but the work really spans all of the most serious infectious diseases as we look to the future. And one of the things that we're most excited about in hosting this panel today, um, as you can see titled The Shift to Endemic, Living Alongside COVID-19, is it, it matches up so nicely with our mission. And as we've lived that mission over the past two years with COVID, we've really um, reiterated the importance of this idea of partnership and collaboration across a variety of different healthcare industry partners, from public health to manufacturing to government and academia. And I think what I'm most excited about today in sitting with this esteemed panel is that we have a really nice cross section of that group. And so I'd like to welcome and introduce my uh, fellow panelists here. So we have Dr. George Benjamin, Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. We have John Trezino, our ex Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial and Business Officer at Novavax. We have Ian Simon, who is the Senior Advisor, the Director for Pandemic Preparedness at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And then joining us virtually, we have Professor Adrian Hill, Director of the Jenner Institute and Co-Director of Oxford Martin Program on Vaccines at the University of Oxford, as well as Dr. John Moore, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at Weill Cornell Medicine. So thank you all so much for joining. So I'd like to kick off the discussion by taking a little bit of a look back at some of the lessons learned as we um, navigated the COVID pandemic and really asking all of our panelists to think a little bit about what some of the forward-looking long-term strategies are as we look forward, not just to address future waves of COVID, but also other serious infectious diseases. So I'm going to start um, by going to one of our virtual panelists, Dr. Moore. Um, you've talked a little bit about how research was really accelerated by the collaboration that came about from the pandemic. And I'm wondering if you can talk uh, to us about one or two lessons learned or examples that you would like to see to ensure we keep that preparedness going as we think about the future. Well, we're not in 2020 anymore. I think the 2020 vaccine rollout worldwide was an amazing success that involved uh, obviously a lot of terrific science in multiple countries, but also um, an attitude from regulators to accelerate every step in the vaccine development process that was required to bring vaccines on stream in the course of that calendar year, which was, I think, entirely unexpected. No one predicted that that would happen within the space of 2020. But I think we're now back in, a, in an era where regulators are moving with traditional slowness and thoroughness and are not responding particularly quickly to the uh, changing environment. There's still a need for better vaccines. There's still a need for better uptake of vaccines. There's still a need to counter disinformation about vaccines. And I, I think whether, whether it's due to pandemic fatigue or, or just a reversion to normality, Everything is now moving much more slowly than it used to be. And I think a shakeup is needed because whatever you hear in the press sometimes and political leaders tend to say, this pandemic isn't over. 
and we're going to see virus circulating for a significant period of time, uh, way out into the future, hopefully with less uh, lethality than we've seen in past years because of population immunity and a gradual uh, diminution of virulence. But the pandemic is, isn't over and vaccines will play a role in the years to come. And I think we need to reset our attitudes to developing and, and approving new vaccines. That's great. It sounds like there's this level of investment that we really need. And Ian, I know you've talked a little bit about investment, both from the NIH and broader government perspective. Where would you like to see us invest as we get ready for the next pandemic or serious infectious disease? Sure. So, I mean, what we saw with the, uh, the, the rapid um, uh, testing and, and, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines in just 11 months from getting the sequence to uh, putting shots in arms was uh, the result of, you know, great regulatory work, an all-hands approach, but also decades of investment in the basic science that um, allowed us to develop mRNA uh, vaccine platforms that, that allowed us to understand what the, uh, the structural confirmation of the spike protein for COVID-19 should look like, how to design that, how to marry that with a platform. Um, and so that was a big success story. Going forward, we need that same type of investment in the building blocks uh, of public health because what we saw was we could have really effective vaccines that only two thirds of Americans felt like they had access to or comfort with or that they, they uh, felt would, um, would be the, the key for them to uh, stay healthy during this pandemic. The, there needs to be a similar type of investment with uh, public health uh, uh, emissaries, officials, uh, community leaders who are touching people's lives more <coughs> than just when there's an outbreak and we need you to take a shot. Yep. So there's a little bit of that sense of urgency there. Um, and John, to go to you next from the manufacturing perspective, I know we've talked a lot about the importance of public-private partnerships in helping with that sense of urgency. So what did we take from that kind of beginning phase of the pandemic where we had those partnerships and what advice do we need moving forward to make sure we keep that urgency going? Yeah, so across the globe, I think we saw um, an urgency um, to investment that needed to take place, risk sharing that needed to take place. And certainly, Novavax was a significant benefactor of uh, resources being made available across the globe. Initially, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, immediately came uh, to the table with us and was ready to invest um, in, in phase one trial, uh, um, scale up of manufacturing, um, investment in facilities. Um, and that was an important initial step. And then immediately after that, we were certainly received significant funding for the US government you know, initially $1.6 billion, which is an incredible number, even to this day when I think about that uh, investment um, in the work that we were doing. But it was even, even m more than that. I mean, there were resources that needed to be made available. There were supply chain shortages. There was uh, clinical trial resources that were needed. And across the, across the, the spectrum of, of, those, um, of those needs, there was, there was some assistance. I, and, and just to ec echo what was said before, I mean, let's make no mistake about it. This was just an incredible success story. I mean, having vaccine developed in, you know, we, Novavax, we did it in, in two years, and we thought that was great, except for a couple of companies did it in one year, which is even greater, and, and, and which is un incredible because most um, vaccines take eight to 10 years to develop. So the fact that the healthcare community, the public health community, the vaccine manufacturers were able to do what they did in this period of time was just a, a Herculean feet. So I think success across the board, certainly lessons to be learned about the future, and I think we'll talk more about that. Uh, but um, yeah, I think that has to happen. That public-private partnership has to happen in an efficient way for it to be a success. That's great. So shifting gears ever so slightly, we've talked a little bit about research and kind of manufacturing and the public-private partnership. So Dr. Benjamin, when you think about um, kind of the public health side of things, you've talked about how we really need to think about things holistically. So what does that mean when you think about this pandemic and where we're going in the future? Yeah, I think we have to acknowledge that we had this an absolutely extraordinary um, demonstration of fast science. Um, but we did not 
have an extraordinary demonstration of fast implementation of that science, getting shots in arms. At the end of the day, it's wonderful to have a therapeutic um, or a prevention tool, but if you can't get that shot in arms, it isn't very useful. Um, so we have this, we've built an extraordinary um, delivery mechanism for adult vaccinations, and yet we really don't have a national adult vaccination program. We have a very effective childhood vaccination program, but now that we've built this, um, my concern is that we're going to let it go. Um, you know, we've, we've empowered other providers to deliver vaccines. We've shown that we can safely deliver vaccines through a variety of providers. We can link um, vaccination to therapy for people that have symptoms. Um, so the next phase of this is really to build a robust um, adult vaccination program so that the next time this happens, which I might add, is not that far away. Um, we, we know the, we can see the virus is hovering. And um, the next time we do this, we need to have that system in place. That's great. And I think one of the um, kind of tenets of public health is also to think about equi equitable distribution. And so, Professor Hill, coming over to you, you've talked a lot about the need to really think about this as a kind of a global distribution. And so we've, we're very focused today on kind of the Maryland ecosystem, but what would you say about what we've learned about equitable, equitable distribution and how we need to think about that moving forward? Yeah, well, I think the great news is we've learned uh, a lot about um, what a challenge it is to try and vaccinate almost 9 billion people who might want a vaccine and might want two doses of that vaccine. So where are 18 billion doses going to come from? Before 2020, I think the record of any vaccine distributed in a year of any type was around about 400 million. So when you remember that, you know, one company in India made literally billions of doses of an adenovirus vaccine in one year and distributed those widely, that really is a huge step forward. But the problem is that we need to sort out biodefense using vaccines. At the moment, we have a maldistribution of manufacturing capacity in the world. And it's no good at all having lots of fantastic vaccines made in industry or in academic labs if you can't manufacture them and distribute them. And today we're a little bit better off, but not much better off than we were in 2019. We have most manufacturing capacity for vaccines in Asia, not in Europe, not in North America. That's where the big facilities are in India, in South Korea, in China. We need to do something about this if we're not living in those three countries. And the time to do that is now. We have, you know, if there's a new pandemic tomorrow, we haven't got the facilities in the Americas, in Europe, certainly in Africa, to manufacture vaccines for the huge population of those continents. So we were relying on Asian manufacturers to vaccinate the poorer countries of the world. Now, luckily, those are the world's biggest manufacturers. They did very well, the cost of vaccine was very low, and you know they used a technology mainly, adenovirus vectors and inactivated uh, coronavirus that was widely distributable, well-established, very safe, and that made a huge impact. In fact, adenoviral vectors saved more lives last year than, say, mRNA vaccine that's has been published recently. But, you know, we need to remember neither of those technologies were standard vaccines before two years ago. Our standard vaccines are protein and adjuvant vaccines. The big advantage of those having been distributed in billions of doses around the world is that we have a safety record of them. We know how to handle them. We know how to manufacture them. So the Novavax vaccine is a conventional, albeit improved, protein and adjuvant vaccine that may well be the standard sort of vaccine we want to go forward with as this coronavirus hangs around for years and years to come, as many of us think it will be. So we've learned a lot about vaccine technologies. We've learned that we have a problem that's not really being solved in terms of how to vaccinate the world quickly and make sure the vaccine gets to everyone. And we need to make sure that those vaccines are affordable because most people in the world can't afford to pay what the U.S. government can pay. 
That's great. And John, maybe to come back to you, you know, this talk about manufacturing and partnership and how did Novavax think about scaling up and finding partners that could help us to do it to add on to what Professor Hill just said? Well, we had to think about it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we, there was the urgency of uh, January 2020 and the pandemic just beginning to present itself and what needed to be done. And, and so, you know, very quickly we were able to take our technology platform um, and, and understand how it could be applied towards a, a coronavirus. But we already had some experience with that with SARS and MERS, and so we were able to move very quickly and identify a vaccine candidate. Um, but it really was going back to you know, the initial premise of the question, which is these public-private partnerships. I think you know, we thought, boy, we know what we need to do. We've, we've done it before. We've gone through manufacturing scale-up. We've gone through clinical trial work. But it all had to be done very quickly and at risk and in parallel uh, with, with one another. And so we built the company from 100 people in January of that year to now over 2,000 people globally um, and, and licensed in 43 countries around the globe. So you had to scale up you know, very, very, very fast across multiple functional areas. And you had to rely upon that functional expertise across the organization. And what you didn't have in-house, you had to bring in or contract externally. I mean, for example, manufacturing was one area that we needed to do that. Serum Institute in India um, was, was referenced uh, by Dr. Hill, and, and you know, they became an important partner for the company. Um, and I think what that teaches us, again, with what Dr. Hill said, is how do we pr make sure that those things are in place going forward? So if we don't have to build them at the time, they're ready to go and they're functioning in some capacity from a warm base or they're uh, constantly thinking about what are the emerging diseases and can we make a vaccine for that and what does manufacturing look like? And so I think that global capacity um, across multiple countries, right? We knew, still know today that low-income countries only have a vaccination rate of about 30 to 40 percent, which is, which is uh, terrible, um, you know, and, and I think we need to improve that, and I think we know ways today better than we did at the very beginning about how to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like there are a lot of lessons learned from, from COVID, and I think in preparing for this, Dr. Benjamin, you talked a little bit about lessons learned from other you know, serious infectious diseases like HIV and what we can take from that as we think about COVID. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think we often make a lot of assumptions about what people know. and. Um, Again, getting the idea of getting shots in the arm and the assumption that everybody understands vaccines and what they are and how they're made, um, the research endeavor behind them, um, they're, not, they're not real clear about that. So I do think we need to do a much better job of um, health literacy for our population to start with. I think that will help a lot around the acceptance of vaccines. Um, I think we also have to think about our manufacturing capacity, what that standby capacity is going to be. You know, part of the challenge we all had was, um, are we going to start producing vaccine A, which is definitely needed in our society for some other disease so that we can produce this new vaccine? So figuring out how we build the intellectual and, and, and financial capacity to have standby capacity to ramp up very quickly to make these vaccines, um, getting the lot sizes correct. You know, early on, we had large lot sizes going into communities when if you're practicing medicine in the community, you need five or 10 shots. You don't need, you know, a thousand vaccines. Um, the fact that the um, initial vaccines required ultra cold storage, huge barrier to delivery of vaccines. So I think as we think about this, we've got to think about the practicality of smaller lot sizes, um, delivery, um, mechanisms, and if we're talking about vaccinating the rest of the world, um, you know, the rest of the world also doesn't have those ultra cold freezers um, anywhere, anywhere else, and so that creates a big challenge to delivery. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Ian, maybe to come over to you, you also talked a little bit about some of the existing clinical trial infrastructure and how we were able to use that to really pivot very quickly to COVID. Um, what lessons learned from that do you think about as we prepare for what's next? Yeah, I think one of the things that we found at, at NIH was um, the, the real critical need to leverage the existing, um, in this case, clinical trials infrastructure that was set up 
to, uh, to test HIV drugs, uh, HIV vaccines, uh, cancer drugs, and put all of those networks together. What happened is we mobilized them all. Uh, uh, we had networks of networks, and they were all ready to pivot towards COVID-19 vaccines. I think the, the lesson there is, is the need to have that warm, ready base, not only for you know, manufacturing, but to get uh, discoveries from the lab to uh, the clinic, you need clinical trial networks that are also sort of on a warm, ready that can pivot. Um, we've got to fund them. We've got to resource them not only with, with, uh, with monetary resources, but human resources. Um, a, a lot of uh, the clinical trials infrastructure uh, is, is manned by, by men and women who are burned out. Um, and so finding a way to support them, to rejuvenate them, to replenish that workforce is also really needed. Yeah, and I think in addition to the clinical trial piece, Dr. Moore, you've talked a little bit about the need to translate some of the, you know, the, the clinical trials to the real world. And how do we do that as we look forward? Well, it's an important issue. I mean, the point was made earlier that a vaccine is useless if it's not rolled out and used. And a third of Americans, and I think a similar before, a smaller but still significant proportion of Britons, are not vaccinated against COVID, they've refused it. A recent survey over the weekend from Kaiser Family Foundation reports that two thirds, of, two thirds of US adults don't plan to have a booster anytime soon, although a new booster has just been rolled out. Now, that booster may not be particularly important for younger, healthier people, but it certainly uh, could be life-saving for people of older and more vulnerable populations. So we have a vaccine uptake problem, and this represents the pernicious influence of the anti-vaccine movement, which in effect, uh, modeling suggests very strongly that the anti-vaxxers killed 300,000 or more Americans in 2021 by persuading them that vaccines were extremely dangerous, whereas in fact, it was the virus that was extremely dangerous. So that's a significant death toll that would have been avoided, uh, but not for the influence of the anti-vaccine movement. So yeah, on the boosters that are being rolled out now, um, some people are hesitant because they've drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, some are nervous because FDA brought the latest booster out without uh, human safety trial data, which doesn't really uh, worry professionals because we know that it's the same vaccines with an adjusted composition. It's equivalent to what happens in flu vaccines. But when the public hears and reads that these new new bivalent boosters have only been tested in mice and, and not in humans. That freaks out a significant fraction of the public. <clears throat> so FDA needs to really think about its messaging strategy in issues like this and whether it should have delayed the rollout until human trial data were available simply as a reassuring factor. But there's, so there's a lot of work to be done to increase vaccine uptake in general and reduce the influence of the anti-vaxxer propaganda movement. I think that's a good uh, segue into thinking about um, how do we move from this acute public health emergency into our new normal? And we talked a little bit in getting ready for the panel about how in the healthcare industry, there are still a lot of people working really hard to address um, you know, the continuous infections from COVID-19, but we are in a new normal and it looks and feels a little bit differently as people look to navigate it. So. Um, this next section, I want to talk a little bit about how we approach things differently, knowing that that's the case. So, Dr. Benjamin, maybe to come to you first, you know, from a public health standpoint, how do we communicate? You know, what are the right messages and messengers to ensure that we keep that sense of urgency fresh for people? Yeah, I think the, I think the first thing we need to do is, is recognize that we have a bunch of trusted messengers that we used, and we need to re-empower them with new information, um, new information about the role of masks, the new information about the role of testing, uh, new information about the role of the new bivalent vaccine, and, and, the, and the, the role of continued um, monovalent vaccine, because it still has an enormous role as we go forward. Um, I think um, as we enter October, November, um, the, the central question is, is it flu or is it COVID, right? You present with fever, chills, headaches, and muscle ache, what do you have? I guess the good news is we have an effective test for both of those diseases. 
uh, we have an effective vaccine for both of those diseases. And I think we need to do a, a, a good job of educating the public about the role of our, all of those strategies, our prevention strategies, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, um, get vaccinated. Um, and by the way, it's effective for both diseases. And as we look at what happened in the Southern Hemisphere with influenza, we're probably in for a moderate, if not maybe even rough, influenza season. And we need to make sure that people don't confuse that with, quote unquote, breakthrough COVID. So we've got a, a really, really interesting communications challenge. And my biggest concern is we haven't start, started talking about that yet. So maybe for our two virtual participants to build on that, when you think about the academic and research side of things, what, what research do we do you need to be able to support some of the messaging that Dr. Benjamin is talking about? Professor Hill, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, I would suggest two things. There are, there are more, but two are very important. And one has been highlighted by the NIH in the last couple of months, and that is being able to protect the upper respiratory tract better with vaccines. That might mean delivering a, a vaccine intranasally or by a spray. But you know, at the moment, that is the weakness of the current COVID vaccines. They're very, very good at protecting against severe disease, protecting against death, protecting the lung. They're not very good at stopping you getting a cold and upper respiratory tract infections. And very importantly, don't protect you as well as they might against transmitting to somebody else. So this does need research. We don't really have a lot of good vaccines that protect the upper respiratory tract. Research is needed in that area. We may need new delivery modalities to do that, but I think that would be near the top of most people's list because you're not really protected against COVID if you keep getting, getting infected, even if you're protected against severe disease. And the second thing I would emphasize is that you know, these new vaccine technologies, particularly mRNA, give you a very good peak of antibodies fairly quickly, but then they need regular boosters. So, you know, very high on the list would be vaccines that have better durability, give a better plateau that is maintained of antibody responses like other traditional vaccines often do. So I think we need to sort that out and figure out, are we really going to need to give people a booster every year, or can we develop technologies? That will mean you get a booster every five years, which would be more cost-effective and ultimately more, more protective. Dr. Moore, what would you add to that? You've talked a little bit about the need to kind of keep the urgency behind vaccination going. Thoughts on that? Well, there are weaknesses in the system in the States uh, for academics trying to translate vaccines. I mean, Academics generally, academic research labs generally are quite good at coming up with innovative new designs, but they don't know what they don't know about translation, which is much more difficult, much more expensive, much more time consuming. And additional expertise needs bringing in from the outside to enable translation of, of the better projects to uh, get into clinical trials and beyond. And, and manufacture on the scales of hundreds of millions of billions of doses. Some designs that you see now that are being promoted in the academic literature and beyond are going to be extremely difficult to translate. And, and if, the, if the designers had really paid attention to translation, they may not have gone as far as they've gone to date in, in small animals, and, uh, which is relatively easy at the academic level. Um, but you know, Adrian Hill has mentioned nasal vaccines, which everyone thinks is a great idea, but where is the strategy for translating them? How, is, how are they going to be proven to be effective? Where are the guidelines about conducting efficacy trials in an era now where phase three placebo controlled trials are effectively impossible? So what is the strategy? Where is FDA and CDC giving guidelines on, for instance, immunobridging. If, uh, if, would immunobridging even apply for a nasal vaccine where there's no evidence and no data on correlates of protection because there's no evidence that, that far enough along yet that they actually will protect? So there are real gaps in the system that need to be solved by public, private sector and governmental 
uh, consultations, and I don't sense that they're happening very much of at all at the moment. And I think another piece of that too is this education around different vaccine platforms. And John, maybe to come over to you, you know, what advice do you think from a manufacturing perspective is needed to help guide manufacturers? And are there things that different vaccine platforms might be able to deliver differently? Yeah, I, I think what, what's important for uh, everybody in the room and around the globe to understand is uh, w where did innovation come from for a COVID vaccine? Um, and, and there's two, two groups in the room today. So Dr. Hill's lab at, at Oxford, I bet people don't know, was AZ's vaccine, right? And so innovation didn't come from the large vaccine manufacturers. Innovation came from the smaller biotech, either labs or companies that were focused on coming up with new and novel approaches to solving diseases. So I think surveillance is critically important um, as we think about the future. I think continuing to be supportive of innovative companies and recognizing that innovation comes from there and then supporting them through a development process and supporting them through a manufacturing process, you know, is, is critically important. Um, and then just to kind of come back from lessons learned real, real quick, I, I think, you know, suddenly Novavax found itself um, with the need to have regulatory approval in 43 countries around the globe. And I've got some regulatory colleagues in, in the room who, you know, are, are looking exhausted even today, two and a half years later. Um, boy, it would be great if we had some regulatory harmonization around the globe so that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel 43 different times and answer a thousand questions multiple times. Um, and so I think some of those things are, are, are really important. Again, especially with small organizations that don't have the resources to do some of those things. Yeah. That makes sense. And maybe to piggyback off of lessons learned, Ian, you've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we learned from COVID are things we need to bring forward and some of the things we don't. And so what are your perspectives on some of the things to bring forward? Um, so I think one of the things to bring forward is uh, a, a mindset that uh, there's no a silver bullet. There's no magic pill, right, that's going to uh, help us uh, deal with, mitigate, recover from, move on from um, these, these outbreaks. It's, it's a layered approach. Um, and I think we need to continue to, uh, uh, to impress upon everyone that it's, it's layers that are both your own personal you know, masking, um, it's uh, vaccines, it's also things that maybe we're not thinking about every day but need to be um, uh, uh, need to be really uh, carried forward, such as ventilation, better ventilation, um, uh, antiseptic UV lighting in big rooms like the ballroom we're in here. Those types of things that are uh, not necessarily seen, but part of a layered strategy, because there's not a one, you know, a one size fits all solution, a magic bullet to, to, to help us move past uh, where we are, where we have this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's other infectious diseases that uh, are circulating not only in the United States, but you know, popping up in Africa and Asia that, that we, we, we will not be done uh, with this sort of posture of, of having to take care of ourselves, our community, our health altogether. And so it has to be a multi-pronged approach. That, that makes sense. And I think one of the things that strike me is different from the start of the pandemic to now is people have more choices now. And so, Dr. Benjamin, you know, how do you communicate with people who you talked earlier about um, there is a low level of awareness about what vaccination is in general? So how do you go from educating on vaccination to now educating on multiple kinds of vaccination? Yeah, that's, that's a, that is a real challenge. But I do think the, the first thing is get people to have acceptance around the protective effect, the fact that vaccines are safe and effective, and recognize that, um, you know, they, they've been safe and effective for a long time for a huge range of diseases, uh, and so much so that we're, we're no longer seeing measles, mumps, chicken pox. Um, I'll leave polio alone for a moment. <laughs> we'll see where that goes. But, but I, think, I think reminding people of how effective they've been uh, and then I think we have to meet, meet people where they are. Uh, you know, there's, there are people who still, they're not anti-vaccine, they're just hesitant. And I think we just have to spend the time to talk with them, educate them, um, accept where they are right now, and then come back to them later 
uh, as we go forward. But we have to do this so that we normalize discussion around vaccines um, and therapeutics. Um, I think one of the fears people had was the speed in which we created the vaccine. And yes, we did this in record time, but it was built on 20 plus years of really good science. So this was, you know, their tax dollars invested in good scientific discovery, which got us here. Uh, and then we now in, you know, 2020, were able to utilize that science to, um, uh, to create this, these marvelous tools that we have. I think we need to do the same thing around communication. We know a lot about risk communication, and yet we continue to, to forget the lessons that we've learned around risk communication, and we don't use them. We decide we're gonna have a press conference, and we put the information out there, and then we, it's kind of one up, and then we go away, mm -hmm. without giving people prolonged understanding of science. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that um, our educational system in our country really has not um, continue to give people the basic biological sciences that they need um, just for, for, you know, living every day. And we need to do a better job of that across a whole range of issues around health education. Mm -hmm. So maybe building off of, you know, education around the public, John, when you think about education of, you know, regulatory bodies and policymakers, um, what's your experience been like talking about the importance of choice and diverse options and things like that? I, I think what was just discussed is, you know, critically important is being able to effectively communicate, right? And, and, and if there's a variety of reasons why people have confidence. One is understanding, right, uh, being confident where the message is coming from, repetition of the message. Choice um, is what we're talking about. People don't want to be just told, well, you have to take this vaccine, right, and just be happy, just be happy with what you got. I think having a portfolio approach to vaccine availability is critically important. Having access to the vaccines are important. And then, of course, having supporting policy. And I think all of those pieces have to come together in a way to give people confidence of, about the vaccine. But I think even in the absence of educating people across the board with basic biologic science, um, I think if you even just take the time to put cartoons together of what a virus looks like and what a recombinant protein nanoparticle looks like and, and how they interact to create an immune response. People understand immune responses, saying, hey, listen, this one stimulates an immune response. And the, the component that's in this vaccine helps stimulate that immune response, kind of like, you know, caffeine is a component of Excedrin that prevents a headache. You know, it just, it has that extra little twist in there that helps, you know, make things a, a little bit better. And so if you explain things at a fundamental level that people can embrace, then suddenly you have a population of people that say, you know what, I, I want a vaccine because I think it's going to prevent me from having serious disease. I think there's a lot more that we can do in that regard to educate the global community about the importance and significance of vaccines. Yeah, that's great. And Dr. Moore, maybe to come back to you, you talked earlier about kind of the misinformation that is shared about vaccines. So when you hear the conversation here about how to educate about vaccination, you know, how do you, how do you think about that misinformation that's being put out there by the anti-vax movement and what we need to do to make sure we're getting truthful information out? Well, the anti-vaccine movement has an infrastructure. It's now increasingly well-funded. There's a lot of dark money behind it. I think by, by uh, right-wing uh, industrial complexes have put money into it. The Koch brothers have been pumping dollars into the anti-vaccine movement, uh, in effect, via the Brownstone Institute and the anti-lockdown people. So, you know, we're, not, we're fighting with one arm behind our backs. We, we need to counter the disinformation and misinformation and promote better information to people who most need it. And to some extent, that's almost one-on-one -on -one and that's not practical with hundreds of millions of people affected by all of this. But there's no central government strategy. We're dealing with uh, you know, legal issues, political issues, the First Amendment, the difficulty in regulating social media the problems of removing inaccurate information from some social media. No one of us has a simple, simple answer to this, but there's no government level programs that are properly functioning in, in any of the Western democracies to handle an increasingly serious problem. So it's easier to see the problems and the solutions, but I, I don't think it's being taken seriously enough because of its implications for 
childhood vaccination. I mean, one of the speakers earlier said there's not a lot of mumps and measles around nowadays. Well, increasingly, there's going to be, and there, there is in some parts of the country, because parents have been persuaded that the mumps and measles vaccines are extremely dangerous and they don't let their children have them. This is a growing trend. And the overall long-term goal of anti-vaccine uh, groups is to eliminate childhood vaccination, period. And I think that the public health infrastructure needs to take that extremely seriously. Great. So, Dr. Uh, Professor Hill, to come to you maybe with the last point, you know, we've talked about a lot of different topics. I think one of the red threads is this idea of collaboration and how the stakeholders on the stage here and everyone we represent need to come together to um, make sure that vaccination is really seen as the best form of prevention. So last word to you, you know, what would you want to leave the panel with in terms of the importance of collaboration around that? Yeah, collaboration is absolutely key. As, as, as you said earlier, we're in a small uh, academic institute at a university and had this crazy idea we might make a vaccine for the world and got pretty close to that, but only by collaborating with 19 centers in the UK, seven centers in, in Brazil, others in South Africa, in Kenya, in India, and of course, manufacturers who did an extraordinary job in producing huge amounts of vaccine very, very quickly. And regulators, as we heard earlier, outperformed themselves in a remarkable way, being standing by waiting for applications rather than us uh, waiting for them to come back to us. So this was a, an incredible collaborative effort. As John said at the start, it's not really happening again now. It can't do, it can't be as quick as that all, all the time. But it is hugely impressive. If you told me five years ago that the world could produce these billions of doses of vaccine and save 20,000, uh, save 20, um, million lives in a single year by distributing a vaccine against a disease nobody had ever heard of at the start of the previous year, I would have thought that was just totally impractical and implausible. It's been done. People made up the solution in real time. We can do extraordinary things together, but let's just help ourselves a little bit for the next time by being, uh, well, a lot more prepared than we were before. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone on the panel for joining today. Clearly, there is a lot of lessons learned coming out of the pandemic, a lot that a lot of good that we need to put forward to as we think about infectious disease prevention globally. And so just a big thank you to everyone and a big thank you to the Marin Life Sciences. Thank you. Thank you.